Yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, and um, thank you to Marie Money for, for, having, for having me. Um, I'll, I'll jump right in. So, um, as you said, the, we're here to discuss the latest developments uh, in the global ship finance market and the, um, the ability of, of Korean shipping companies to access international bank finance. Um, by way of very brief background, um, as we all know, 2023 has been the third um, hottest year on record. Uh, global temperatures, I think, were 1.29 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So we are very close to the 1.5 target, which I think we're expected to reach in the 2030s. So that first development in the market is clearly the increased focus on decarbonization and ESG. Whilst it may not have come as quickly to the Korean market um, as to, say, the European market, uh, the Korean shipping industry is, of course, aware of the um, challenges it faces uh, in the ESG space. So to jump right in and ask what the expectations of uh, international banks are for their Korean customers, um, I will start, start at the far end with Mark. Um, Mark, how important are ESG considerations when you're considering a transaction and a customer, and is that necessarily part of the credit process now? Right. Oh, thanks very much, Ben. Thanks for uh, hurting this particular cohort of uh, banks and uh, talking about our favorite subject nowadays. Um, how should I say it? I've been doing this for 25 years. And, uh, you know, it's, um, we're used to talking about counterparties, the ships themselves, the cash flow. Um, but it is now very clear um, internally and externally that ESG criteria will become part of the credit process going forward. Um, not just in the senior loan space, I'm sure my fellow um, panelists would share more, but I think in all tranches of capital today. Um, ESG is a, is a broad topic today. Now we mainly talk about environmental concerns because it's, they're easily benchmarked. Um, but I would say the social and governance uh, aspects have always been around as well um, as part of our evaluation criteria. If we, if we talk to management, we look at your board composition, we look at how you treat your crew, we look at how often you appear in the newspapers. Um, those are things that we've always um, considered and taken care of. Um, and uh, nowadays we know that uh, it's not like when I went to business school 30 years ago when we only talk about maximizing shareholders' value, right? We talk about all the stakeholders um, in the ecosystem. And, um, yeah, but so environmental, uh, obviously getting a lot of attention nowadays. We've heard so much, but uh, clearly every other aspect of ESG is, is, part of our, uh, is part and parcel to the credit process today. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. And Miyang, um, do you think it's, is it the bank's responsibility to simply support the ship owners um, uh, in their efforts to transition, or, 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 or is it more than that? Are you there to set you know, standards for the market and even drive, drive change? Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> Hi. Um... I'm working for Transport Capital, but my, my partake here at this panel is uh, as a representative for Tekka Bank uh, in Germany. We act as an Asian, um, Asian desk for them. Um, to answer your question, I think uh, it is, yes, responsibility of the lender to, you know, make sure that our industry goal aligned, you know, with the target uh, every year and we have like time span set. Um, so it is bank's responsibility, uh, but it is not only bank's responsibility because I mean, it's everyone like market participant, you know, uh, takes their own part on homework to do, uh, to make this collective work. I mean, otherwise, I mean, we cannot achieve this goal. Um, so, um, yeah, but, but uh, what I can say is that uh, banks' uh, role in this matter is probably one of the most powerful uh, because, I mean, Poseidon principle is one that, you know, more and more banks, you know, participated and like, 
aggregate, uh, you know, some of the uh, portfolio, shipping portfolio of this member bank, you know, has doubled over, over the past three or four years. And uh, it consists of like, you know, close to majority of, you know, what it's uh, outstanding right now in shipping, shipping size. So when this grows, I think, uh, you know, more and more ship owners need to care and, you know, try to accommodate uh, this rule. So I think financing will be the uh, key, um, the component and, you know, role to play for this uh, issue. Yeah, okay, and, and, and Thomas sort of related. Um, uh, so yeah, the banks clearly want to be ambitious in the targets that they are setting to, to drive change. But do you think that sometimes this is, is, is too much? Is it realistic or do you think this is uh, too difficult for the owners uh, to, to meet these targets and does it favor you know certain owner groups you know the big groups over the over the SMEs uh, thank you um, I think size uh, makes matter in this case and I think the big groups will always benefit uh, in today's market in comparison to the, the small ones because it, with this all regulations coming in, there's a lot of cost coming as well to, to, to manage uh, the, the information flow. I don't think the, big, uh, the small companies are prepared to, to provide that kind of information to banks uh, at the moment. And if we're gonna start to exclude them from uh, ship financing, then they will have to go to even more, more expensive cost of financing. And by extension, this is gonna deteriorate the results. So at the moment, I feel that we are putting a lot of uh, focus on ESG. At the same time, I, I, I think I wanna defend a bit ship owners. This issue was very important five, six years ago when the bank took charge together with the Poseidon principles. They expanded, they pushed, they, they, they incorporated the Poseidon principles in their policies. And at the moment, if you look what the ship owners in Korea, but elsewhere, are doing, they are really focusing the business to be as ESG friendly and even consider strategically direction of their, 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 their purchases, the movement into different businesses, very much focus on the future. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> and uh, sorry, staying on ESG, Lincoln, uh, not missing you out. Um, so, yes, I mean, banks are focused on the companies. And I think some banks even have, you know, a scoring or a rating system for the company and its ESG initiatives and, and targets. But what about the assets themselves? What about the residual value risk of, of the vessels? Is that something that you consider on a transaction where you have a mortgage over a a vessel, and of course the tenor may last beyond 2030. If you enforce your mortgage, <laughs> you could end up with, uh, with the vessel. Is that something that's clearly a consideration for you? Thanks, Ben. That's a very interesting question because as a bank, uh, DNB is not the most cheap. We, in fact, uh, we are probably a bit more expensive than most people, but on the back of that, you know, what we do have is you know, a whole suite of products uh, that uh, also employ the resources of the whole bank. And when we consider risk and assets in terms of whether they will be stranded you know, beyond 2030, we have to be very careful in terms of how we put it across. Because today, if we look at the technology, a lot of it is there, yes, but there is not much standardization just yet. We are speeding up very quickly towards it, the target 2030 year, and it makes it very difficult for us to decide. And I think that's where banks and lawyers uh, have a very important part to play because we are in the midst of conversations with our clients, and it is a consensus that needs to be formed and each individual company by itself will always worry, will I make the wrong decision? Am I going to make the, you know, the worst choice? So for us as a role, we have to be able to help drive that change. And I think that's where we as advisors, you know, both on the legal side, uh, the financing side, uh, can definitely push towards a change. 
Now, DNB seems to be a bit more competitive when it comes to financing 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds as compared to the rest because we have a model that allows us to look at assets beyond a certain period, whereas many banks today take a corporate approach towards lending. And it feels you know, to us that where we look at assets, uh, it's also together with whether we feel the company as a whole is trustworthy enough to be able to make the bold steps to modernize the fleet, to retrofit as necessary, to put in place measures uh, that will help them, for example, using different kinds of fuels, putting in place uh, new engines, scrubbers, etc. You know, as we have uh, seen in the past. Uh, when IMO 2020 came about, uh, you know, we were all worried about you know, what's going to happen. Is it going to be a low sulfur fuel uh, dominated solution or is it going to be a scrubber solution? And the deadline came and people decided, oh shit, we're too late. You know, let's all just install scrubbers because we have been discussing for three years and uh, nothing came out of it. So let's just fix the situation as best as we can. Yeah, and just, uh, I suppose, as long as you're talking about IMO, we may as well stay with you for a second. <laughs> I was going to talk about the Poseidon principles, and I think as DNB is one of the founding members, we may as well get your views on, I think, how the, the recently announced changes to the Poseidon principles in line with IMO's new emissions reduction targets. Um, I just thought you want to comment on, on the Poseidon principles and your uh, role uh, you know, how the Poseidon principles impact on your strategy and your, your appetite for deals, especially following the recent changes, you know, have you become more selective? Um, yeah, so Poseidon principles, you know, as a founding bank, you know, we are definitely a bank that wants to push change through the Poseidon principles. Now, the Poseidon principles is a way for us to think philosophically in terms of where we want to be or where we want to go. So for example, as a bank, you know, we are very strict with regards to ship recycling. We require documentation to include language around how you're going to recycle your ships, for example. Now, the Poseidon principles you know, can also unfortunately be like handcuffs because once you've signed up to it, you know, it means that you have to do things a certain way. And if you were to try and innovate your way out of it, you know, you tend to find yourself a, a little bit more restricted. I think you know, as a bank that has signed up to Poseidon's principles, you know, we have always tried to drive the conversations together with our clients. Our clients may not be the happiest with us because every time we meet, we're talking about, how's your ESG going? Uh, and that's not the most fun topic for ship owners to want to talk about. Uh, but you know, I think we all have to just face the music and realize that uh, banks eventually will become more and more selective, basically because regulations require them to do so, whether or not voluntary or involuntary. So when banks start discussing these sorts of uh, restrictions uh, and as well as how you're going to strategize around mitigating this risk, um, I apologize in advance and hope that you understand that we don't have a choice either. We have to answer to our monetary authorities uh, respectively and you know, it's credit is asking us these questions, compliance is asking us these questions, regulators are asking us these questions and unfortunately as banks, uh, we are the best targets to ask uh, what are you doing about your clients and your portfolio. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, staying with the Poseidon principles and, and now looking at Mark again, I'm just looking at the founding members of Poseidon here. So um, I, I, we're in Korea, and obviously the ECAs are extremely important uh, for Korean shipping. Um, I think I'm right in saying, though, that Sarche is the only uh, ECA as a, as a signatory to the Poseidon principles. I wondered what your view is on whether the Korean ECA should be either signing up to the, well, green initiatives like the Poseidon principles or, you know, some otherwise underwriting green or sustainable um, finance, you know, what should they be doing? Thanks, Ben. Um, we try to come to these conferences to make friends. Uh, I try not to lose any, but uh, I think all of you have heard me on stage and off stage that uh, signing on the Poseidon principle for us was a no-brainer. We have to follow the IMO pathway 
as Lincoln mentioned, it's the, the regulation is there, the science is there, um, we have to do the best we can. Now that said, um, as Ben rightly mentioned, Sache, uh, and also I think um, some other policy banks such as uh, KFW, for instance, have already signed on uh, to the Poseidon principle as well. Um, every country, every region, every policy or public institution, uh, financial institutions, have their own green guidelines. Uh, of course, here today we've heard about Kay Scholl talking about the WTIVs. We've heard about Kexim talking about the very many different types of uh, support of lending that it um, um, gives to its clients in the shipping space, talking about um, their the, uh, um, uh, commitments as well to environmental concerns. Now, of course, I always encourage them to sign on to the Poseidon Principle. It's how the 30, now I think it's 30 banks, um, 134, thank you, um, about 175, 180 billion uh, portfolio. It's how we keep ourselves honest. Um, it's how we make sure that there is a compass, make sure that the certain timers are set on the kitchen counter, so to speak, with the 20, 50, 40, 30 um, uh, 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 trajectories. So um, the reporting, as Lincoln mentioned just now, yes, it is, uh, you know, I, I may not call them handcuffs, so to speak, but they are certain things that, again, it keeps us transparent, it keeps us honest, it keeps us and our stakeholders, you know, not just our shareholders, but also uh, the, our, the society that we live in, uh, our employees, you know, our children. Um, it keeps us honest. And uh, I would, of course, here again, um, ask you know, the, the, in Korea, the policy banks, the ECAs, perhaps to consider um, and to, of course, have that dialogue with us, with your clients, um, who should also be very, very committed and aware of the regulations and of the um, scientific boundaries that we're all pushing today and how to do um, the best to meet the IMO set pathways. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I'll probably get in trouble now, but to play devil's advocate just for a bit, I just wondered whether, clearly decarbonisation is important, but I wonder if we're focusing a little too much on ESG in the, in the shipping context. I mean, just we heard this morning, <clears throat> you know, the shipping industry as a whole accounts for less than 3% of global greenhouse gas emissions. You compare that with I think 23% for electricity and heat, 24% uh, for industry, which half of that is cement and steel production, 22% um, for agriculture, 18% for land transportation. You know, if we're talking about 2.8% for shipping, which is a need for everyone for global trade, it's clearly important, but is it an easy target? I uh, appreciate that's a difficult question for anyone to answer, so anyone want to put their hands up? Otherwise, I'm going to nominate Mark again. <laughs> um, please feel free to jump in. Um, take that mic from me. Uh, um, I think we, we're here to, at the end of the day, we're here to support our clients. I think the last thing that we want as banks is to say, we can't do this anymore. Um, you know, we've been, Credit Agricole, we've been doing shipping for 30, 40 years. And the last thing we want is to go to our clients and say, no, sorry, we can't do this. And it's nothing to do with you. Um, so I think that's, that's the first thing um, we need to consider when we, when we talk about ESG and whether it's, it's overly done. Uh, because you say it's 3%, right? But that's the size of a country. Let's say the size of Germany, it's emissions. Right. Um, we don't have any low hang. Well, we we hadn't had any low hanging fruits. And there's no Tesla of shipping. There's nobody putting batteries in blue water ocean going vessels because that's just not feasible. We have many parallel solutions instead. We have coastal ships using uh, battery or hydrogen. We have LNG as our transition fuel. Um, hopefully, we have ammonia and methanol in the next five ten years. Subject the fuel being there, but that's a different story. Um, so all we can do is try to stay on that cusp of technological advance um, and then tell our clients who we don't presume to know more than they do and have them tell us, you know, how they're going to overcome and how we can support them. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I, I mean, I'll ask it maybe to Thomas a slightly different, different way around. Um, in that, I mean, ESG, yes, it has clearly come to the forefront of decision making for banks and, and for governments in particular. Um, it's clearly a major disruption event um, and going to drive the industry going forwards. But is it, is it the only consideration right now or are there more important things? If you have good credit business, are you going to turn it away because it doesn't meet your ESG um, uh, initiatives and um, uh, trajectories? Um, I think it's not that we're going to turn down any business. It's simply we have our policies. It's something that has been agreed at the back of uh, signing of uh, principles. And if a project fits in within that parameter, we're happy to look at it, especially if the credit and everything behind the project works for us. So definitely we will not dismiss any project because let's say that that's a tanker, at least not at this point in time. Offshore, it's a bit of a different story. I think many banks are stepping out of that. Uh, one uh, commodity that our bank cannot support at the moment is coal, and that's the only one that I can point out to. Other than that, if you have a sound project, we're happy to look at it. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, on, on, on that topic, I think 80%, I think, roughly, of, of the world's energy, well, primary energy, is still produced from um, coal, uh, oil, and natural gas. <clears throat> um, that amount will fall uh, with the rise of renewables, but I think it's still estimated that by 2050, the world will still need 50 million barrels of oil a day. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of financing the transition kind of maturely, um, sustainability has clearly become a very key issue, but with the political uh, difficult issues around the world, uh, energy security, uh, is also now perhaps equally important and of course affordability of energy also remains important. So maybe I turn back to Miyang. Um, uh, as, as, as well, various people have said, we've seen some banks pull back altogether from financing oil and gas assets and actually even now uh, transportation of uh, oil and even LNG. Um, do you think that's right? <laughs> or do you think that banks have a responsibility to act um, maturely in financing the transition over a period of years rather than just mm -hmm. switching off the financing overnight? Okay. Are there any banks who decided to exit? <laughs> just to be politically right. Um, I think it is, uh, I mean, at the bank level, I mean, for their own portfolio rebalancing purpose, I think they may do, you know, choose or, you know, to leave or to enter, whatever they can do. But if it is, if its decision is solely for this ESG issue, that, you know, why they left, you know, this uh, type of cargo uh, shipping, I think it, it may, you know, overdo it. Um, I think this transition, you know, cannot happen overnight. Um, we cannot just, you know, shut down and go back to Mayflower era. So I think it takes time and uh, we have like good uh, timely um, objective and we have like, you know, planned trajectory. So every market participant, especially, you know, lender side, you know, if they do like try to comply on this over time, then I think we have the future rather than just exiting shipping right now. Okay, thank you. I mean, you say we can't go back to the Mayflower, but actually people are now, of course, developing effectively sailing ships again. So, you know, maybe we are. Um, maybe we should move away from ESG because there are other issues uh, that are affecting the market. So. After 13 years of very, very low, uh, almost zero interest rates, of course, we're now in a, in a period of uh, high interest rates. Um, the US dollar has also appreciated against many currencies, including the Korean won. Um, and whilst I think some Korean shipping companies have hedged their exposure 
uh, to interest and currency risks. Um, that has certainly not been universally uh, adopted in, in the Korean market. Um, maybe Lincoln, um, I guess a two-pronged question. <laughs> Do you see potential fallout from that? And also, how can the shipping companies uh, benefit from um, uh, hedging products uh, that, that, that the financiers on this panel, I'm sure, can offer? Thanks, Ben. I think that companies in general will have an opinion around how much they want to hedge. So, for example, we would say a treasury department of a larger corporation would have such policies in place, maybe not so much the smaller uh, ship owners. Um, but I think definitely there are a few products that we should consider. For example, you have the typical interest rate swaps. Uh, you have the currency swaps. Uh, the interest rate swaps, uh, if you, for example, had swapped just before uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, you would have been uh, making perfect timing. We had a few clients who uh, suddenly told us, look guys, uh, you know, let's uh, explore putting an 80% uh, IRS on uh, all our ships across the portfolio we have with you. And we were like, wow, that's a bold move. But uh, you know, a month later, um, they were right. Um, and uh, banks are suffering big losses around that. But I think that's just a, a classical example of how polarized uh, opinions can be around hedging in general, because for every person that says something's going to go up, you know, there's going to be another person that says it's going to go down in order for that hedge to take place. You know, if everybody wanted to bet on the same side of the coin, that's not going to that's not going to work out. Um, so there's that, and, and I think for the currency swaps, you know, I I'm not sure in particular how exposed uh, the Korean. Uh, ship owners are to the global industry in terms of the U US dollar and the euros. Uh, but I think, you know, for a currency swap to take place, you know, you have to consider, for example, your revenues as well as your costs uh, in terms of where your money is coming in and where your money is going out. And if there's a mismatch, then perhaps there needs to be some policy in place that helps you to manage the kind of risk. Now, DNB, for example, does these two uh, products very well. But in addition to that, we also do, for example, oil price hedging. So, for example, if you were to do uh, a lot of oil trading or you use a lot of bunkers, uh, DMB is also able to help you hedge that pricing. So, for example, uh, you know, almost a decade ago when we saw oil prices starting to shoot up, you know, there was a lot of inquiries into can we hedge the bunker fuels? Uh, can we hedge oil prices in general? Uh, on an unsecured basis, if uh, DMB doesn't have existing assets with you, maybe it's a bit tough. Uh, but you know, uh, for example, if we were to have a relationship with you in general, and we uh, see that there is something that we can do together, that's uh, an option for us to consider. Uh, also, we have uh, what we call FFAs, uh, the, f the freight forwarding uh, agreements, uh, that allow us f to uh, help you to hedge as well. So, for example, if you had a portfolio of uh, dry bulk assets. Uh, and that you have uh, certain spot arrangements on that, certain long-term arrangements on that. You now we can also trade these FFAs uh, with you as your uh, uh, either interim or final uh, counterparts. So I think there's a lot of uh, products that we can help you with. Um, but I think in this era where volatility is very high, uncertainty is very high, I think it makes sense to pay a little bit of cost uh, in order to help you manage the kind of risk that you have. Uh, I think there's also a lot of views as to whether we are at the peak. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. But I think as a banker with a very credit-focused mindset, uh, no, it, it seems to me more natural that uh, taking some of that risk down uh, it would be quite uh, functional in terms of your risk to reward ratio. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Lincoln. Um, just looking at some general issues, I think, finally. Um, Miyoung, you were mentioning earlier about tr transport capital being an exclusive agent in, in, uh, in Asia for, for DECA and for, also for HCOB. But in terms of DECA, I think um, you've just entered the Korean market as of last year. I just wondered 
sort of, you know, why now? What, 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 Timing-wise, why enter the Korean market now? And as a relatively new entrant, what, you know, what are you, what are you looking mm -hmm. for? Um, thank you. Um, De Deca is newcomer to Korea market, uh, but it, it is not new to shipping. They have been doing uh, shipping finance over 30 years and uh, 40 years for aviation continuously. And it is one of few lenders remaining after, you know, German KG in German. So, uh, and we have done, you know, some of the Korean related transactions for, you know, airlines and shipping as well, but we decided to come to this market to focus on in full scale uh, lately, la late last year, you know, after, you know, two years COVID, you know, nothing could be done and it was only late last year. Three rationals uh, I can share. Uh, first of all, the size of the market, I mean, Korea with healthy ecosystem, everything is here. And uh, also on the uh, ship owning side, I mean, Korea is fourth largest ship owning nation in terms of uh, gross tonnage uh, unit, only after China, Greece, and Japan. So there are so many ships to finance and to refinance. So it's uh, naturally our first uh, rational. And the second is that, you know, we all know that Korea has gone through so long painful and uh, harsh restructuring era. And then they emerged with very much str strengthened, you know, balance sheet and the healthy, you know, financial conditions with a very, you know, prudent fleet and operation management strategy. So it means, I mean, the, the uh, target clients here, you know, present all those, you know, stable and like, you know, very uh, healthy transaction opportunity, which DECA uh, really focus, like top tier, strong balance sheet and, you know, good uh, fleet. Um, that, that is second reason, and also the tr transparency. I mean, Korean ship owners from, you know, uh, number one down to like very small owners, they present their financials audited, uh, you know, at least annually or, you know, semi-annual or quarterly even, you know, in public so we can access to it. Um, and that, that is very important for us to analyze and monitor. We are uh, here for long term. I mean, we have a very flexible way of participation, you know, from bilateral club deal or, you know, big syndication as a humble participant, or we are even open for secondary. Um, so we hope to, um, you know, fill up, you know, whatever left. And also, you know, we don't only focus on the long term chartered uh, ships we can do you know shorter term or even spot trading when given you know very clear uh, fleet management strategy so I think uh, yeah we are hopeful and do many transactions until 2050 I don't know how old I will be but uh, <laughs> yes we are here long term yeah. okay thanks and then maybe Thomas in terms of I mean, do you want to comment on the Korean shipping company's um, approach to shipping over the last 10 years and um, its direction going forwards and, and you know, what, what the expectation of international banks is? I mean, the topic of the panel. Um, <laughs> do you want to comment a little bit about that? So as uh, sorry, I may mention, there was an issue uh, 12, 10, 12 years ago, and uh, the, the, the the need for restructuring proved to be beneficial for the companies. Now they all focus on long-term charters. They have a strong balance sheet. They have a clear cash flows. Therefore, it became a very interesting partner and a target client for many international banks. I would say that Korea probably is the most desirable uh, region in Asia at the moment because of what uh, it offers uh, the, and the shipping companies here. So I'm pretty sure there will be more and more competition, and I hope that the, 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 the approach to the business that is in Korea will spread and is going to be more visible around the, the world. Thanks. Two minutes left, so okay, great. Time for one or two more questions, uh, which why don't we uh, flip to, to Chinese leasing? Um, I know no one on the panel here is a, <laughs> a leasing company, but with the decline in traditional bank financing in, in, in recent years, uh, we've, we've seen an increase in, in interest and, in fact, in deals of Chinese lease financings in the Korean market. Um, 
I mean, they offer high LTVs and long tenors. Um, I just wanted someone's views on, you know, is that always um, appropriate? Is it always useful to, to Korean owners? Uh, does it pose a threat to international banks? Uh, or do you see it as a purely as a, an opportunity for Korean owners? I can take uh, some answers. I mean, DECA has been uh, very active in Chinese leasing market as a back leverage lender, uh, but we decided to kind of, you know, rebalance that uh, because of this, you know, uh, potential geopolitical issues. I mean, w when it comes to single transaction, I mean, maybe, you know, better or to maximize the equity return if you use a higher leverage at like, you know, longer term and like lower yield, but, it is not always ideal for like portfolio level. So, I mean, all, all this geopolitical issue or, you know, potential sanction, if, you know, we kind of, you know, imagine it, it is not invisible and it's un, uh, unquantifiable. But when it happens, I think it, it can be very drastic and uh, it is something that you really have to kind of analyze and, you know, uh, try to reduce the overall you know, fleet or financing uh, standard deviation. I, I think that should be uh, desirable. You mean poten risk of potential sanctions being imposed against China and whether Korean ship owners should be considering that now? Yeah. Yes, because it happened. I mean, we can use the example, you know, uh, uh, from my colleague. I mean, we, we've seen this uh, one of the Russian leasing company, you know, leased the uh, ships to European ship owners. And when you know, a sanction happened and then ship owners, you know, couldn't, you know, access to their ships or, you know, pay for it. So it took a lot of time and it's costly and go through all this, you know, legal court uh, proceedings. So, I mean, it may happen. I'm, I'm not saying it will, but uh, it is something that we have to take into consideration. If you, you use too much of this, then I think always the diversification of the financing source, you know, would be very um, material for the continuous growth. Um, so, yeah, that's... Mm. Uh, uh, we're out of time. Okay, uh, we're out of time, apparently. So I'd just like to thank all of my panelists and uh, the audience and Marine Money. Thanks very much.